Good afternoon, and thank you for coming here this afternoon. Uh, ever since 2002, the Georgetown Public Policy Institute has sponsored an annual lecture in honor of our late colleague, Leslie Whittington, who died on September 11th, along with her husband, Charlie, and her two daughters, Zoe and Dana. Leslie was one of our most beloved faculty members, a warm, caring person with a great sense of humor. If you knew Leslie, you would never forget her. And that is why we honor her with this annual lecture as a bittersweet remembrance for some of us, but for the rest of you in the hope that through this lecture, you'll catch a glimpse of her passion for people and for ideas. Uh, in addition to the lecture, we have a Whittington Scholarship. This year's Whittington Scholar is Rebecca Searle. And Rebecca, I'd like to ask you to stand up and take a, a well-deserved bow. When Leslie was the associate dean of our program, she arranged for the president of Resources for the Future to speak at one of our public policy dinners on the environmental challenges that face our nation and the world. This was a topic of considerable interest to her and especially to her husband, Charlie, who served as director of research for Ecologic, a firm that seeks to preserve and protect threatened habitats in the developing world. Leslie and Charlie would be especially thrilled to be hearing from our guest speaker today, the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu. Not just because of the topic, but also because Dr. Chu so admirably illustrates the potential of successful university-based scientists to help solve some of the most important policy problems that we face. Dr. Chu is a distinguished scientist who served as director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and professor of physics and molecular and cell biology at the University of California when President Obama asked him to become Secretary of Energy in January 2009. He has also held positions of considerable responsibility at Stanford University, at AT&T, and at Bell Labs. Dr. Chu's pathbreaking research on atoms won him the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1997. I won't attempt to explain what those discoveries were, because it might betray a lack of subtlety in my understanding of atomic physics. <laughs> but suffice it to say that even Bill Nye, the science guy, would have been deeply impressed. As Secretary of Energy, Dr. Chu supervises 16,000 employees with a budget of $24 billion. He is charged with helping implement President Obama's ambitious agenda to invest in alternative and renewable energy, end our dependence on foreign oil, address the global climate crisis, and create millions of new jobs. Please join me in welcoming the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Um, uh, Great pleasure to be here today. I want to talk to you about something uh, I care deeply about, something that made me ultimately leave academia where I was um, quite happy, uh, and to uh, go into what ultimately I, I never actually dreamed I was going to go into uh, government, but certainly to and something that uh, is a challenge, is a problem, and most importantly, it's an opportunity. So. What is this issue? I'm going to stick my neck out and make two predictions. But before I do that, I want to remind you what the great philosopher of the 20th century, American philosopher of the 20th century, said. By the way, that great philosopher is Yogi Berra. <laughs> the predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. <laughs> so um, prediction number one, the price of oil will be higher in the coming decades and we will live in a carbon-constrained world. And I think uh, I want to tell you why I think those predictions will come true, uh, what the challenge is, and what the opportunity will be. So why will price of oil be higher in the coming decades? Well, if you look at the resources on this x-axis, this is the amount of oil in billions of barrels. This is the oil already produced. 
This is the average production price, all in costs of what it might cost to produce. It varies uh, in, in certain areas like uh, Saudi Arabia, it's less than $20 a barrel. In other areas, it's about that. But, but uh, so here's what we have now in conventional reserves and other conventional oil. But that doesn't mean we run out of oil. There will, in fact, be more oil. Uh, we are increasing the amount, the capability of recovering from these conventional reserves. So even these things are elastic. But then you go to these EORs, enhanced oil recovery, ultra deep water, uh, Arctic oil, very heavy oils, tarry oils, and for example, Venezuela, uh, and uh, oil shales, the tar, also the tar sands in Canada. So if you look at this, most of the reserves are in unconventional oil. Um, in fact, because of their unconventional oil with today's technology, it looks like it's going to cost of scale 60, 80 dollars just to produce, whereas already the average of the oil production today is maybe 20 dollars, and yet oil is selling for 80 dollars a barrel. Um, most of the multinational corporations, the Royal Dutch Shells, the BPs, the Exxon Mobiles, the Chevrons, have most of their reserves offshore now. So again, it's it's a, a swing towards uh, more expensive oil. So, so this is. Uh, the supply, we won't run out for a while, but it will get more expensive to recover. And this is a projection of the uh, Energy Information Agency uh, pr makes projections. This is the amount of liquid fuels we produce, dominate completely by oil, a little bit of, a very teeny bit of biofuels, and projections of an increase in the world. So the demand will go up, and yet the reserves, in order to recover those, it will become more expensive. So that's fundamentally why I think the price of oil will be higher in the coming decades. I don't know what it's going to be six months from now, a year from now, but 10 and 20 years from now, there's a, a reasonable expectation it will be higher. Uh, why will we live in a carbon-constrained world? Well, uh, the climate is changing. This is the direct temperature measurements starting in 1880, it actually goes back to about 1850, and it's been increasing. Um, it's fair to say, do we understand some of these things? For example, this red line is the five-year running average, and do we understand why it had this little bump where it cooled and then rose and then another bump where it cooled? Uh, nor do we understand why in the last eight, ten years it's plateaued. Uh, but we do believe we understand the overall trend, even though we don't understand the details of this. And let me just indicate why. First, uh, these are the concentration of greenhouse gases going back. This is the present day, but going back a 1,000 years. So it's pretty stable in carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. And you might ask, what happened? Well, about this time, the Industrial Revolution began. Uh, and then you might ask, well, okay, the carbon started increasing at this time. Is it a coincidence or is this carbon in the atmosphere put up by humans? It's a legitimate question. And um, there are a number of indicators of why it's caused by humans. Let me just tell you one that's becoming increasingly more compelling. We have in, in the upper atmosphere radioactive carbon a carbon made by cosmic rays bombarding nitrogen, and it makes radioactive carbon. This is the carbon that we use for carbon dating. So what happens is in the upper atmosphere, you make this radioactive carbon. It goes mixing down uh, throughout the whole biosphere. Anything living incorporates this carbon into, you know, you and I have lots of, not lots, but a little bit of uh, radioactive carbon dioxide. And in the same reason why we can date things, Shrouds of Turin and other things, by we can date how old things are because when we no longer are living, we're no longer connected to the biosphere, uh, and then you get buried. And suppose it's a pretty good coffin and you're isolated from this because we're not burying you very deep. But just pretend we just buried you uh, really deep in some coal deposit <laughs> or some oil deposit for tens of millions of years. Even after hundreds of thousands of years, because the lifetime of carbon-14 only is 5,700 years, if you go underground for
for a million years, that carbon-14 is no longer there. It's decayed. Okay? Now, if we now take you up, you're now part of our oil coal deposits, and we put you in a power plant. Um, you are, we have just put up carbon dioxide that's just been uh, depleted of carbon-14. So what happens is this curve over here is the increase in carbon dioxide, and this green curve is a ratio of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere to the normal non-radioactive carbon. And as the uh, amount of carbon dioxide goes up, um, the amount, the ratio of radioactive carbon dioxide goes down. Now, you notice that the record disappears around 1950, whereas the record of carbon dioxide has increased. So why is that? It's because something happened starting in 1945, and what happened is we started exploding nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. And so because of that, we have this black line that shows this huge increase in radioactive carbon that then decays. But we understand how the atmosphere mixes, and, and the only way this purple line is what we would have seen if it was, there's only bomb testing, and yet it's going down faster than that decay. And so if we can get the observed curve, if we combine what we know about the bomb testing to what we know about fossil fuel emissions, that gives us the observed path. The point here is that even with this huge perturbation of atmospheric testing, that happened after uh, World War II, uh, this is a signature that the amount of carbon-14, the radioactive, is plunging faster than just bombs and mixing and radioactive decay. And so it's completely consistent with the fact that we are burning fossil fuel and we're putting up non-radioactive carbon dioxide. So not only is it just a coincidence that it happened to start when the Industrial Revolution, it actually has our fingerprints all over it that it's due to fossil fuel. So, so that's another fact, that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is due to humans. Then the question is, okay, if it's due to humans, can we model what's happening? The red is the observations, the temperature observations, and we put into our climate models all the natural variations. The sun has 11-year solar cycles. Uh, when you have a massive volcano, it shoots a lot of sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, and that has a cooling effect, all those things. And if you put in all the natural occurrences of the solar cycles and things like that, we find we can't really account for the temperature increase. But if you then put in the fact that we have put in those greenhouse gases that now have our fingerprints on it, we have a reasonable rough fit to uh, the increase in temperature. So this is one of dozens of bits of information that tell us that uh, the temperature increase is caused by humans, mainly by humans, and although we, as, as I'll say, we don't, we don't understand all the fine bumps and wiggles, the general consensus is we understand the overall shape. Let me summarize. The amount of energy hitting the Earth, oh, certainly over the last several decades where we have good satellite data, we can monitor the solar intensity, the sunspot activity, the microwave radiation, all that stuff says it's, besides these oscillations, flat. So there's been no real net increase in energy coming in, and yet we put up a greenhouse ga gas layer that keeps the heat energy from leaving. So the question is not whether the Earth is going to heat up, it's how much it will heat up. Okay, that's the question. Now, it turns out the Earth compensates for at least half of what we've done. It actually self-corrects. But there's part where it doesn't fully correct, and that's where we're seeing today. Now, again, going to predictions, these are, those are measurements I told you about. This is, this is now predictions, and there are some potential effects. And there are a number of things that we are worried about. I'm just going to pick one, water shortages. All right. So again, this is uh, a prediction of the future. It's uh, certainly by no means like the hard data I showed you on the temperature increase or the amount of carbon-14, but it's, uh, our best models are saying that precipitation, of course, will increase because if the Earth gets warmer, there's more water evaporation, and so there's going to be more rain, more snow. So the question is, when does it occur? 
Unfortunately, it occurs in winter and early spring. In summer and fall, well, summer is the one that counts, late spring and summer, uh, there's decidedly less precipitation in the United States. And so the snows and uh, rains are coming at the wrong time for agriculture. So that's one thing that we're looking at. And, and these are not small changes. And for, for example, in the Midwest and in California, where we grow the large portion of food, we're looking at uh, 10, 23% decrease in summer precipitation. Um, if we look at uh, the amount of heat projected in the recent past from 1961 to 1979, you look at the days that were above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you see a little bit of smattering in, let's say, the deserts of Arizona, California, a little bit in Mexico, Texas. And if we continue on a business as usual course, it's meaning that we keep increasing the amount of carbon dioxide uh, and follow that trajectory, um, there will be many parts of the United States that will be uh, above 100 degrees. Um, again, because of in the summer times, uh, the evaporation from the soils will, will increase. And so there will be great stresses uh, both in California and in the Midwest. So because of uh, the rain not coming at the right time, uh, it also is projected to come not only more in snow and rain in the winter, but it comes more in, in uh, high precipitation conditions, torrents, rather than nice drizzles. And in the summertime, you have less soil. So this, this is an issue. In the United States Global Change Research Program, it's a publication put out by NOAA, it's a government organization, they're saying in the Midwest and the Great Plains, we will expect to see decrease in soil moisture and availability and the rising temperatures will lead to higher evaporation rates. Jobs will stretch the aquifers. The aquifers in the California and the, and the Midwest are shrinking uh, time average over the last couple of decades. They're going down, the water tables are going down, and this will, this will increase. And so uh, this is the situation that we're looking at if we continue on the path as usual. Now, as a challenge to uh, you people, as I try to bring this information out, um, I need your help because what uh, the elected officials, let's say the senators in the Midwestern states say, this is all fine and good. I think you know, this, is, you know, this is what the science is saying, but the, my farmers aren't concerned about what will happen 15, 100 years from now. Uh, they're interested in what will happen next week. Will it rain next week? So this is a challenge that uh, one has to think about. Now, one other last thing, which is not the water shortage, but there are other issues that we're worried about. And quite frankly, we don't know exactly when they will happen, at what temperature this will happen. But as an example, in the northern parts of the world, there's a lot of carbon that's there in the soils. So what happens if, if you have a tree or some moss that grows in Alaska or, or Siberia? When that stuff dies, unlike a Brazilian rainforest, where there are a lot of microbes that take it, chew it up, digest it, turn it into carbon dioxide and methane, and it gets recycled, in these northern frozen regions, the microbes are frozen. And uh, you've done this experiment many times in your own freezer. If you take some organic material and put it in your freezer, you can keep it for months. It might not look so pretty, but you can still eat it. If you take that same material, a piece of meat or whatever, and you put it in your refrigerator, within a week it spoils. So going from freezing below freezing, slightly below to slightly above freezing is a big deal to the microbes. When they're above freezing, they wake up and they do all sorts of things. And so this is beginning. We don't know exactly when it will occur at which time there's a runaway effect where the microbes wake up, they're no longer frozen, they start to digest all the carbon that's been accumulating for millennia, and they release it into the atmosphere. And the amount of carbon, we even don't know that, but it could double the amount that's currently in the atmosphere by that alone. So if this happens, then it gets kind of out of our control, okay? Uh, because no matter what humans do, the, as it warms up, the microbes will do the rest. So those are concerns. 
So those, that's one example of what I call a tipping point. There are a number of other tipping points um, that are dangerous. And so that's why the climate scientists in the last couple, in the last decade are calling for more aggressive action. So, so that's the challenge. In each succeeding year, despite what you may read about climate gain, things like that, the real scientific data, the hardcore, is getting better and better. And so now, here's the opportunity. We're going to need, effectively, a new industrial revolution to mitigate these dangers. We also want to decrease our dependency on foreign oil. And so that means we want to produce energy. I'm not saying we're going to give up the energy we've gotten used to. Um, um, you know, a standard vacuum cleaner is one, let's say, uh, I in fact went to the hardware store and looked at this, you know, one to two horsepower. Uh, you plug a thing into a wall and out jumps a horse to clean your carpet. It's pretty good. Uh, so we, we, we've gotten used to uh, all sorts of conveniences. Uh, I, for one, do not want to be here in August uh, without air conditioning. Um, but we need the energy in a way that uh, produces far less carbon dioxide if we want to make a world that's better for you and your children. Now, so what's the opportunity? The opportunity is a new revolution. There was a first industrial revolution the United States played a dramatic role in. There was a semiconductor computer revolution that the United States led the world in. There was an agricultural revolution the United States led the world in and biotech revolution. And here's another one, except this is going to go as deep as the first industrial revolution. So how are we doing in this? Well, not so good. Uh, this is the amount of solar photovoltaics uh, generated in, in the middle 90s. The United States was leading, led the market share. We had 45% of all of photovoltaics sold around the world. We're now about 5 or 6%. And uh, what's replacing us are uh, countries like U U uh, European Union countries, uh, Japan and China. But this is just one example. If you look at all the other technologies which we will need, like improved automobile efficiency, we are not the leaders there. If you go and buy a, um, a hybrid car, 98% of the batteries will have been made in Asia. So we're no longer the leaders there. Electricity transmission, uh, we were the inventors of it. Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla uh, invented the first electricity transmission systems in the world, but we we're no longer the leaders there. And all that, all the gizmos that Tesla and others invented, uh, the so-called power electronics, the major power transformers, we we're no longer the leaders there. We built the first nuclear reactors, but the leaders are France, Japan, uh, Korea. So. Uh, this is the issue. Uh, if you give one example, China's leadership has recognized, and they make no bones about it. Uh, they, uh, I talked to the premier of China nearly a year ago and the vice premier, and they said that climate change, if we continue on our path, climate change to China and the rest of the world will be devastating, that China's growth in carbon emissions is completely unsustainable, and we're going to do something about it. That tone was very different when I talked to the Premier three years ago when I was briefing him on a report that I co-chaired where he talked about energy efficiency, but he wasn't talking about climate change. Okay. And so what China is doing is they're uh, investing a lot, $9 billion a month. Uh, as one example, $88 billion in a state-owned company by in the next 10 years for ultra high voltage transmission lines to take energy, renewable energy in the western part of China and port it over to the eastern part where their population centers are. So they're the, now the leaders in the highest voltage technologies in the world. They have a, a very ambitious target of 100 billion watts of wind generation by 2020. They're serious about it. They are closing down their old inefficient coal plants. They're building 21 nuclear reactors. They're trying to switch from coal as much as possible to gas. They're doing all these things to diversify their energy supply uh, and to also increase energy efficiency. So they're serious about it. We, you know, quite often you 
any consumer good, um, you look in the bottom of it and it says made in China. And so uh, the feeling is we've seeded manufacturing to China. Uh, well, it's even worse than that. High technology manufacturing, aerospace, pharmaceuticals, electronics, test equipment, all those other things. Uh, the blue is the United States global market share of exports. Uh, the red or purple is uh, the European Union and green is China. So China has actually just passed us in high technology manufacturing. This is deeply disturbing to me because there's no reason we should ever concede high technology manufacturing to anyone in the world. It's uh, less about all sorts of labor costs. And in fact, if you go to some of these factories in China that they're building, they're heavily roboticized, highly automated, it's not about cheap labor. Um, so that's a concern. Now, in the Recovery Act, because of the world recession, um, the government, the administration, and Congress have put a, uh, a huge down payment, $80 billion, on the clean energy economy. This is to create new jobs, but it was also to invest in the energy infrastructure, uh, energy efficiency, plus uh, cleaner energy to put us in a position to be competitive in the future. Uh, that momentum has started, but it needs to be continued. Now, so what should we do? Well, in the next few decades, energy efficiency and conservation are going to be the most effective tools. Let me give you one example. Here's a graph of the size of the average refrigerator in the United States from 1947 to 2003, and you see it ever is increasing. Uh, beginning to level off, uh, not because of the sating of the American appetite. It's the size of the kitchen door, <laughs> even though American families are getting, on average, smaller. Um, this is the energy of the refrigerators per refrigerator, and it has gone down. It's gone down by roughly a factor of four. 25% of, you know, today, an average refrigerator uses only one quarter of the energy used in the middle 1970s. When these regulations were passed, first in California, these are California state codes, um, the refrigerator manufacturers screamed to the, very loudly, the American consumer cannot afford these refrigerators, this is terrible. And so what happened is this is the inflation adjusted price of refrigerators over a period of time. So they got more efficient, but they got more economical. Why? because a better insulated refrigerator needs a smaller compressor. If you design it right, you can actually make it more cost effective. And so um, it can actually be improved. It can be improved by a factor of two. Now, is this a big deal? It is a very big deal. If you took our refrigerators today and pretended they were um, operating in 1975 efficiency standards, we will be using a lot more energy. How much energy? More energy than all the wind and solar energy we generate today. Okay? 4% of the energy of electricity. Okay, so this is a single unit. Refrigerators, both residential and commercial refrigerators, is a very big deal. Let me give you another example. Homes and buildings, they can be made much more energy efficient. And so, because of these, we're accelerating appliance standards, and uh, this is our appliance standards. Uh, we, we're coming up with 15 a year. Um, uh, the president has tasked us to double that rate, and so uh, we are doing that. And before, we used to be historically late in these standards, and now we're on time. And for the first time in the history of the Department of Energy, we're actually enforcing the standards. What a novel thought. <laughs> um, and it's actually having an effect. Um, we put people on notice. We're starting to rip Energy Star ratings away from people who did not earn them. They sue us. We're upheld in court. All good. Um, <laughs> because because uh, if you do pass law, it's nice to enforce it every once in a while. Um, now, we want, I talked about buildings, and um, if you build a new home, there are many, many studies. The late one is McKinsey study that said, you know, if you put in $1,000 more insulation, 
$1,000 in labor and materials, just $1,000 in a home that might cost $100,000 to build, that investment would have paid for itself in one to two years, depending on where the house is. Okay? So you might ask, and there are some states in our country who have no energy efficiency installation standards at all. And uh, as one governor tried to explain to me, uh, we understand we're wasting money, but it's a state right to waste that money. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is something, this is a, not a federal policy, it is a state and local policy. I don't mind keeping a lo state and local policy, but how do you encourage that? Because it's a false choice to say, you know, would you rather have insulation or would you rather have a granite kitchen top? You can have your granite kitchen top and you have your insulation and you can go on installing granite tops um, for the next uh, 30 years uh, because of the money you save. And so in, in many of these instances, simply just a, a sensible regulation, because people aren't going to look around and buy, and the builders of houses don't build these houses because uh, uh, they're putting more insulation than required, believe me. So we are having access to information, uh, developing energy performance labels for homes so you can have a more knowledgeable buyer. Um, if you uh, want to, if you want to retrofit your home for insulation, uh, sometimes uh, you don't have access to financing. It might take $10,000 to replace all your leaky windows. But if you replace your leaky windows and could borrow those $10,000 at a, a, a moderate you know, mortgage style rate, uh, we feel that the money saved on our monthly pay, payments for that loan will be compared to uh, the money saved by the energy uh, your saving in your utility bills will be more than the loan payments. And so uh, what we need to do is we need to improve the ability to get financing that is self-paid. That it's not actually paid by the government, but actually because it saves you money on a monthly basis with no out-of-pocket expenses, surely we have to get this to work. And that's one of our philosophies. Um, and we also need... Um, people who will do a good job in retrofitting your homes. One of the things we are trying to pilot is to mass produce retrofitting. Let's say on your block, if a third of the homes, a quarter of the homes decide they want to get retrofitted, first they need an energy audit, then they have to identify good contractors, all of those things. But then you have to go around and there's a lot of labor in calling up these people, having them come to your house, getting quotes and all these other things, and you're not really sure are these the right people. Suppose you were assured that this contractor or this deliverer of this service uh, is trustworthy, and because it's a quarter of your whole block, one truck goes out and, and does the energy audits, another truck goes out and, and blows in insulation or people go and lay it house to house, uh, it makes the delivery of those services much less expensive. And so this is what we're trying to do, um, is to get whole neighborhoods to retrofit. Uh, there are other things we're noodling around with, and we are open to all ideas that you may have on how do you actually make the energy and money savings a norm and make it easy, because it's that I don't know what to do, which is the biggest issue in many people's minds. Um, so we're working on that. We're also developing technologies that will have significant impact. Um, photovoltaics uh, have been going down in price. Uh, at the start here, they're over $20 per kilowatt installed, and they're going down, down, down. Uh, and so they've improved by about a factor of 10, factor 10 less expensive. And, um, and what is driving this, this is not time, this is the amount installed. And as you start to go into bigger productions, uh, industry naturally finds economies of scale. And so th you, these things are in intercepting at a dollar per module cost. And so what we're doing is we're now developing a challenge to the photovoltaic industry. Can you make photovoltaics dollar all in costs? not only a module, but the electronics, the installation, everything. If it costs a dollar a watt, everybody says, 
you start putting this everywhere without subsidy. Right now, for a large box up like a Home Depot store, you know, those, those large thingies, you know, box top stores, uh, it's about $4 of water, okay? So it has to come down by a factor of four. But if it comes down by a factor of four, uh, major things will happen. It will come down by probably a factor of two in the next decade, but can we accelerate it? And so we're trying to do that. Um, we have a lot of energy. I told you about oil, but we actually have even more coal in the world. Three quarters of all the known coal reserves are in the United States, China, Russia, Australia, and India. And the United States owns a quarter of the known coal reserves in the world. So we're the Saudi Arabia of coal. Coal is, um, the way we use it today, is not very clean. We are capturing some of the sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, but we're not yet capturing much of the mercury in particular matter. Uh, we are trying to develop some technologies, and we're investing $4 billion in clean carbon capture and sequestration. That's what CCS means. And it's being matched by $7 billion in the private sector. And um, we are trying to figure out how we can use this uh, resource in a clean way with a goal of perhaps getting routine commercial deployment in eight or 10 years. Um, we're not guaranteeing that that can be done. Right now, it's much more costly, but we have to, if we're gonna continue to use coal, we, we need to do this. And since we own a quarter of the sector, uh, we should do it. And people say, well, Steve, coal's, you know, clean, really clean coal is impossible. Why don't we just turn it back on? We have a lot of natural gas, we have you know, all these other things. But the point here is that Given where the reserves are, China, India, and Russia are not going to turn their back on coal. And so it's the developed, uh, more developed countries really have, a, in a certain sense, a responsibility, but also an opportunity, because if you develop the technologies, that's something that you can export. Nuclear reactors, uh, again, there's mixed reactions to this. Um, but. I see this, in, at least in this century, as a transition until we are able to develop a transmission system that can distribute renewables uh, widely, until we develop ways of storing both on a local level, a building scale or house scale, and also on a utility level. Uh, it's hard to go beyond, let's say, roughly 30% renewables. 40%, uh, 50%. Once you do that, you know, the wind does stop blowing, the sun does stop shining, and without other backup sources, there will be um, blackouts. Uh, nuclear reactors, we're, we, we've offered a, the first set of loans. The idea here is, again, this is something where the nuclear industry was stopped for 30 years. We want to show that these reactors can be built on time, on budget, and as soon as that's demonstrated, I think the U.S. government should get out of it and let the commercial market make a decision. But in addition to the standard reactors, which cost a lot of money, they cost between seven and nine billion dollars. And so if you're a utility company, let's say your total capitalization, your total assets are, I'll make up a number, 10, 20 billion dollars, and one reactor costs eight billion, that's like, betting the company on this thing. And so it, it comes in too big a chunk. And so with small modular reactors that can be mass produced in a factory, uh, that can be shipped by uh, truck or rail or by ship, uh, you make this into bite-sized pieces. And so before the thinking was you need to build it really big to get an economy of scale because each reactor was a unique reactor. And now we're thinking if you can actually crank these suckers out uh, you get a different economy scale of sort of mass production. And uh, it can be, you can drop these in in moderate sized power plants that where the transmission system won't even take that billion uh, watts or one and a half billion watts, which is the standard reactors are today. So, so we're, we're trying to push on this technology. All right. We also need uh, rapid large scale deployment of technology. That technology requires investment. Most of that investment will come from the private sector. Investment is directed in opportunities where you can make money. And so the market opportunities where you can make money are actually structured by policy, which are 
uh, you know, your forte. And so the question is, how do you actually construct policies that guide the free enterprise system we have in the U.S. to do this? Uh, strong policies have guided clean energy investments. Uh, Germany's, including the carbon cap, a green bank, renewable electricity standards. Spain has other uh, issues, and China has a slightly different form of government, so they can do things in different ways. <laughs> um, uh, but in any case, let's focus on Germany and Spain. <laughs> um, uh, how do you how do you get these policies? And and so this is the uh, clean energy investment in the United States. So um, the most important policy I think we will need is not only the tax incentives, stable tax incentives, and this is why, uh, and we're feeding tariffs, this is why Europe developed wind turbines, because they put in policies that were in play for 10 years or more, and the heavy investment that was needed to make wind commercially viable was done in places like Denmark and Germany. It wasn't done in the United States because we had on-again, off-again policies. So we need those. We need, in areas in the industry which doesn't do R&D, the utility companies won't do R&D in coal unless we help, in carbon capture, unless we help them, so that's that. But the final thing we need is we need a cap on carbon, and we gotta put a price on carbon, and we need to say that the carbon emissions have to decline. Uh, in order to prevent the worst of the things on the climate change that I was talking about. Why is this important? It's because if you're a utility company and you're gonna build a power plant and you're gonna invest a couple of billion dollars in a coal plant or a nuclear plant or a gas plant or whatever, that's an investment for half a century. And so you need to know what's gonna happen in that half a century. And so right now, capital is sitting on the sidelines. Banks are not sure what's gonna happen and uh, the rate commissions that decide the price of electricity are not sure what's going to So everything's kind of on hold. And so we need to get off this on hold stuff, especially now in this recession where the unemployment is so high. This market clarity of where the country is going actually sparks innovation. If you look at the United States and Australia about the green patents, and this is just one mark, uh, those countries that approved the Kyoto Protocol, you see uh, a huge number of patents increasing, whereas the United States and Australia remain flat. Now, the good news is the United States has the best innovation machine in the world, bar none. It's, uh, the United States invented silicon photovoltaics and the silicon photocell, the first transistor, the integrated circuit, the lasers, uh, satellite communication, global positioning satellite, all invented in the United States. So, we have this capability, but it needs to be guided. There's another issue, and that is increasingly more and more scientists, not only old ones like me, but young ones who have their career ahead of them, um, are saying this is a serious problem, but it's also an exciting opportunity to solve this problem. And so just as in times of emergency, Los Alamos, MIT's radiation laboratory where they develop radar, this is part of uh, Manhattan Project where this is Glenn Seaborg and he was tasked with how do you separate out plutonium. These people were willing to live in, in places very far away from anything uh, where their, their families were essentially held in communicado uh, from the rest of society for three, four years. Uh, they were willing to work on this problem. And, but if you look, at, there's something else going on here. By assigning brilliant teams of scientists and engineers to work on a problem like in the development of radar, um, we actually made much faster progress. And because of that, we are trying to duplicate those things and also what happened in Bell Labs when it set out to invent the transistor. They didn't happen to come across this. It was a very targeted thing. Bell Laboratories uh, and AT&T depended heavily on the use of vacuum tubes, but vacuum tubes would always burn out. So I said, if we can make a solid-state version of a vacuum tube that can be made much smaller, uh, we could have a communication system that was better in transcontinental traffic. You know, you bury that thing under the water, you can't fix it anymore. And so most of Bell Labs was interested in making vacuum tubes last one year, two years, six years. But a part of it said, okay, go invent a solid-state vacuum tube, and they came up with the transistor. So again, teams of scientists were asked to do these things.
And so we're, we're doing similar things here in the Department of Energy. So let me, let me just close by reminding you of a picture taken uh, when I was an undergraduate. It was the first mission in Apollo that went to the far side of the moon and it orbited the moon. And here you see a very bleak lunar landscape, a very inviting Earth. And I want you to notice something. There's nowhere else to go. Uh, and so uh, the astronaut, Bill Anders, who took this picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Since 1968, we've also discovered we have altered the destiny of the Earth. It's due to humans. And in order to minimize uh, that alteration, we have to start working. Uh, now, going back to my favorite great American philosopher, Yogi Bear, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. And, uh, and when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> We're at that fork in the road. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Secretary Chu. Secretary Chu has kindly agreed to take some questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please go to the mic. Uh, please state your name first. And uh, remember, as Shakespeare once said, brevity is the soul of wit. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very lucid uh, discussion of what faces America and the Earth. Um, it's great to hear some um, scholarly talk on this after eight years of somewhat of a black hole in space. So um, to, to ask a question, I, I live in New York. I, I work here, but I live in New York. And uh, on Friday, David Brancaccio did a very interesting expose on fracking and the uh, situation where, I guess, politics and policy have been caught kind of in a subterfuge, where fracking is obviously good for releasing you know, latent gases for natural gas discovery. Um, but it also is highly polluting or could be highly polluting based on the data. I was wondering if the DOE has any position on this because I know I think the uh, EPA has been taken out of the loop uh, oh. uh, because of political ramifications uh, that you had nothing to do with, I'm sure. Uh, I, I didn't know it was taken out of the loop. Um, I think, first let me say something about natural gas. It too is a transition fuel. Imagine a world of 50% renewables. Um, and then the sun stops shining somewhere, let's say in the clouds roll by. There are only a few sources of power that you can start up very quickly. There are two, hydro and natural gas. And so, believe it or not, uh, we will need natural gas to make a transition to uh, renewables because it's much cheaper to build a natural gas plant than to have it stay idle. If you build a coal plant, if you build a nuclear plant, you want to run it 24-7 if at all possible. The other thing is that natural gas will also be used for energy storage. If you make, suppose wind and solar become really cheap and you start to deploy this, any excess electricity you generate can be used to either pump water up a hill to store it, to let it come down, or compressed air into a cave or whatever. And if you let that compressed air help spin a turbine as it comes up, you also want to supplement that with natural gas. So natural gas will play a role in the transition to a clean energy future. And it also gives us, you know, its energy in our borders. Uh, fracking is a technology, you said it exactly right. Uh, it, I, it can be polluting if it's done irresponsibly. But the, for those of you who don't know, uh, you have to drill a hole and using fluids of various kinds, very deep, so the Here's the top of the ground. Here's where the water table is. You have to go through the water table very, very deep and inject these fluids. And so safety depends on making sure that seal as you go through water tables is really intact. Because what you don't want is you don't want these fracking hydraulic fluids to get into your water table. That would be bad. Uh, so so I, I think the issue here is make sure that um, the companies that do do this, and it, it has to be regulated, it has to do it in an environmentally responsible way. Now, uh, I think in some instances, I, I think that is probably true. I've been telling the gas industry, you know, 
you know, until we're going to have to get some sort of regulatory thing going on that. But the industry, bef for its own self-protection, better start on itself. And, and so, again, it's one of those things where it's incumbent on them. If, if you start polluting major water tables with this stuff, it'll be killed. And so it's very, and, and so it's very important that they, they do this responsibly. No, yeah, that, that I think they backed off on that. Uh, yeah, they have. Uh, uh, the, the major Catskill area of the Marcellus shales, they're, they're no longer doing that. And as, you know, until, until you get widespread experience that it can be developed safely, the people have dropped off from that. So anyway, so that's, that's one of those issues. But it, it, I, I think it can be done, but you've got to demonstrate to the public that it can be done safely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chu. It's truly an honor to have you here. Um, you mentioned a lot of technologies that we're uh, putting investments into. And uh, given that these technologies are very wide, diverse, and sometimes situational, and there are even technologies that we don't know about, right. and given that you mentioned that Yogi Berra quote that said, uh, predictions are hard to make, how is any one person or committee of people uh, qualified to basically pick winners and losers in the, uh, in the energy market? Yeah, we're not qualified. Now, that's why we try not to. Uh, so in, in the first analysis, I think what you need to do is you need to develop policies that can tilt the private sector investments. So just say that uh, uh, clean energy is very important. It's, it's for the same reason why we need clean air and clean water. And so you want to make those investments. Now, we are investing in various things. Are we picking that carbon capture and, uh, and storage of coal, and by the way, it's going to have to be natural gas as well, it, is that, are we putting all our eggs in that basket? We can't because there, is, you know, we might not make it uh, cost effective. Uh, if you go down the list of things, we are spending, certainly I didn't, there are a lot of things I didn't talk about. We're spending a lot of money on batteries. Most of it, and what the government does best is it, uh, it invests in the more basic research. Um, as you get closer to applied and finally to piloting and eventually to deployment, the deployment becomes very expensive. And so for deployment, we are, you, we, in order to get first, first adopter, again, very cost, costly, and so we will help maybe on first adopter, but quickly thereafter, we can't be doing this. On the research side, um, different industries have different ideas and how much they should invest in research. If you're in a high-tech industry, because of the way high-tech was generated, both in semiconductor and computer, uh, but also in pharmaceuticals, if you're a high-tech industry, investing 20% of your gross revenues on research and development is not out of the ordinary. In fact, it might be considered low. Um, it's very different for power generation, electricity generation. Um, we spend about a trillion dollars a year on energy, oil, gas, coal, you know, just fundamental cost of energy. Forget about all the value added stuff. And I hope I impress upon you the fact that in order to get this new industrial revolution going, it will necessarily have to be high technology. We can't use the technologies developed invented in the first industrial revolution. All right, 20%, that's $200 billion a year. So how much are we investing? About three. So there's a big gap. And you know, the power companies don't really, they're not like AT&T, and they, they take a huge amount of the revenues and do it in Bell Labs uh, or, or things of that nature. And so this is, again, something until we get them going on this, uh, I think that's a role that the government has to play. So research and development is something that, that is important, and we are not so much picking winners, but actually trying to develop a wide portfolio of possibilities, again, just to get it going. Thank you for your lecture, Mr. Secretary. Uh, it seems clear that there are really important mitigation efforts being undertaken, but given that there are tipping points, like you mentioned, it seems that adaptation is maybe just as important. 
in responding to climate change. And so I was wondering what your thoughts are about that and also if those considerations are informing the infrastructure investments that's happening with the Recovery Act. They're beginning to, uh, if you're planning to build, you know, a lot of airports are actually near, near uh, the ocean. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of them are landfill. And so if you are building something like that near, near the, you know, we're saying build it five meters higher, okay, because uh, uh, things can change. And so people are beginning to do things like that. Now, in terms of, so, so there's adaptation like that, I think in the Western states, they've been seen over the last couple of decades and certainly forecast of the climate to change even further that there are increasing number of droughts. Uh, the snow is melting sooner. Uh, a lot of the pine are now dying because the, there aren't deep enough frost to kill the pine bark beetle. And so when you lo lose a lot of the forest cover and the snows are melting sooner, that means your water storage system is now compromised. You get more runoffs in uh, early spring. And they are trying to adapt and um, trying to look at how you can uh, possibly increase the hype dams, do things, how do you do more better water trading, other things. But, but the fundamental issue actually is not solved. Um, there are going to be increasingly water rights issues in the western part of the United States because there's simply not enough water. And if the trends continue the way they are, and if the trends continue the way they're predicted to go, it's going to get much worse. For example, the Sierra's snow cover in a very optimistic scenario might be compromised by 20, 30 percent by the end of the century. In a business as usual scenario, it could be compromised by 80, 90 percent. That has profound impact. Let me tell you, I'm from California, when you, you have 20 percent less snow, you know, rain's no good. It rains in the winter. If it rains in the winter, it's no good. It just runs off. And we need it for, for uh, storage, for agriculture, and for drinking. Um, California spends 20% of its electricity moving water around now and increasing. Uh, so these are issues that if it changes the way some of these, the climate models, the standard climate models are saying, um, there's, a, there's an adaptation beyond which I'm a little bit concerned about. Uh, the tipping, you know, Greenland. It will take, the good news is, it probably won't happen in your lifetime that Greenland will melt, okay? Even in business usual, because it will take 100, 200 years. But if it does melt, it's a seven meter increase in the sea level. If Antarctica melts, it's a 61 meter increase in the sea level. And we actually know approximately what temperature those things will melt at. There's geological records, roughly eight degrees centigrade for Antarctica. It will take hundreds of years. Uh, but it's not good, you know, so now we're talking a couple hundred feet increase in sea level. I suppose it happens over 300 years. Well, there's a lot of cities within a couple hundred feet of sea level. So, and a couple hundred years is, may not be enough time <laughs> to adapt. So. So um, what's the probability we'll ever get to those high temperatures, like eight degrees centigrade? Um, not large. If we continue business as usual scenario, the probability is 50% will be below four, four and a half degrees centigrade, but 50% will be above that. And there's a tail that goes well beyond six degrees, just as business as usual. So let's say there's a 20% chance we'll go to six degrees. Well, that's, once it melts, Greenland, you know, it's two kilometers, three kilometers thick. And, and so it melts and you're exposed to the land and the land warms up. So that's another one of those tipping points that might become, and, and we see in the geological record when Antarctica thaws and when it freezes, it, 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 it takes additional cold to refreeze it. And so those, again, so, so uh, you know, this is all about risk management. It has, you know, you don't have to be certain that these things will happen in my mind. If you say there's a 50% chance that these things may happen, we should do something about it. But let me stress the opportunity so it's not lost on you. 
There is an economic opportunity for us to lead in the industrial revolution that we need. The American innovation machine, if it leads in this, will create jobs, it will create prosperity. So do it for that reason. We're just about out of time, but let's squeeze in one last question. Uh, once again, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Brett Nadrich. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service studying uh, in, uh, environmental politics in the developing world. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the international ramifications of our domestic energy policies. Um, the specific case I'm thinking of is with regards to biodiesel and the fact that recent developments caused a 3% decline in U.S. oil prices, but a 50% increase in the price of me uh, corn in Mexico, which is a staple of their diet and caused riots and whatnot and other areas of the developing world. Thank you. Well, first, let me it's much more complicated than saying corn ethanol caused the price of Mexican corn to increase. It's, um, I, I, I looked into this, and the, the price of food is is highly tied to many, many things, uh, the first of which is energy prices, because in corn in particular is heavy fertilizer, heavy mechanization. But let's, I'll be the first to say corn is not a long-term solution by a long shot. I, I don't think it makes that much sense. And so what we need to do is we need to get off using corn to produce biofuels. Ethanol is not uh, a good, ideal fuel either. Um, we need to get off of ethanol because ethanol can't be, it absorbs water and so you can't even pipe it around in existing infrastructure and pipelines. Uh, Brazil, which is a big, you know, sugarcane ethanol does make sense uh, because those plants are perennials. You, you harvest them in the fall and they grow back. The roots are still there. They fix their own nitrogen, so a lot of the nitrogen inputs are, are not needed for that but corn is heavily fertilizer intensive uh, in many parts of the United States and needs irrigation, which means money and energy and all sorts of things. So we, uh, we would like to, while biofuels, especially technologies that convert bio wastes into fuels is something we're very eager. There's lots of wheat straw, rice straw, corn husks that uh, now they used to burn. You can't burn in many states now. That goes into landfill. It goes. It's cycled into carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and how do you convert that material into transportation fuel, or even co-burn it with um, fossil fuels, is something that we would like to do. Uh, especially if you then trap the carbon dioxide from those fossil fuel plants that are sharing it with with uh, bio waste. Uh, the plants are sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. If you put that away for hundreds or thousands of years, this is good. You're actually sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. So what we would like to do is, and the good news is there are very, very exciting things, developments in uh, developing ways of converting bio waste and, and crops like grasses, switchgrass and acanthus, um, or lumber waste that don't compete directly with food and using those types of sources in order to get transportation fuel. Uh, very exciting developments. Microbes now that produce gasoline, direct substitutes for gasoline and jet fuel. You feed them simple sugar instead of making ethanol, uh, you, you make gasoline fuel. The yield is low, but uh, I, you know, in one group that I know very well, it's a friend of mine, when I was director of the lab, and that, lab that research unit was established, tells me, we'll know whether it's a go or no go in two years. So it's not, you know, wait 15, 20, 50 years. This is, there's some really exciting developments going on. I don't know whether it might pan out my net. It might not, but that's the nature of research. The good news is there are so many really smart people now thinking about this. And that's different than it was 10 years ago. Really smart young people thinking about this. So now, I know most of you are not scientists, but you can also think about the policy issues and how do you shape the future, uh, because we need smart people there too.